Hello everyone. We've got some more mid-2000s mystery machines to explore. These are all either missing parts or otherwise in disrepair. So this could turn into a salvage operation. So let's tear into these and find out. Starting with this Cybermax machine. This case is in pretty good condition. We've just got a few scuffs and scrapes here and there. No nasty yellowing anywhere. And as far as I can tell, the only thing that's missing is this drive blank here. Got our DVD-ROM here. Got our power button. Reset button. And I'm guessing we only have LEDs back here. I don't think we have a cool seven segment display. Hopefully I'm wrong, but I don't think it's back there. Got a pretty well-preserved Windows sticker here, designed for Windows NT and Windows 98, as well as copious amounts of ventilation holes. We'll just call those speed holes. We've got some more speed holes in the back here. This thing must be crazy fast. But we can see it's an ATX system. It looks reasonably modern. We've got onboard USB and all kinds of color coding. We've got plenty of I.O. options and a very helpful sticker indicating what all the ports do. And this label here makes me think this must have been some kind of pre-built system. At least someone went through the effort to assign it a serial number. Maybe there's more to Cybermax than I realized. And for peripheral cards, we have some kind of video card there. Got a NIC and a dial-up modem. We also have some more helpful stickers here in case you forget. We've got an interesting asymmetrical screw pattern securing the case with only three screws. I guess it's one way to save costs. Let's get this thing open. All right, got those screws out. Now this should just slide back. Aha. And check out that teeny tiny motherboard. Barely fills out this case. I don't see a brand marking on it, but it looks like a BioStar. Model M5 ALC with an ALI chipset. And we've got AGP, PCI, and ISA. Got a Socket 7 CPU, so either a Pentium 1 or AMD K6-ish. Let's find out exactly which CPU that is. That is a very stuck heatsink. Anytime you have a heatsink that's stuck on the CPU, try to avoid pulling it straight up, because when you do that, you risk pulling the CPU out of the socket, which could damage it. Instead, try to use a twisting motion. Just be cognizant of all the capacitors and things that are surrounding the CPU. Wow, that one is incredibly stuck. There we go. And that's an AMD K6 II. And that thermal pad sure put up a valiant effort. That thing is gone. Let's clean that CPU up and see exactly what it is. And it is an AMD K6 II, clocked at 450 megahertz. I want to pull it out of there, but first let's knock this dust off. Because I don't want it going down in the socket. There we go. Okay, no trouble with the pins at all. Let's just leave this out for now. Okay, let's see what kind of video card we have. Yeah, not many identifying marks on this thing. It looks like an NVIDIA card, possibly a Riva, but hey, it'll do. Now let's check out that NIC. Got the Wake on LAN connector here. Looks like it must be a 10100 NIC. No gigabit in this system's era. And now the dial-up modem. And that's our standard issue dirt cheap 56K modem with a Lucent chipset. One day I will find a use for all these old dial-up modems. And there's our sound chip, an ESS Solo 1. These chips actually have excellent DOS compatibility, so that's very nice to see. Okay, let's see what we have for RAM. Got a 64 meg PC100 stick that clearly spent its whole life getting blasted with dust. Single-sided module. And some of these capacitors are looking kind of sketchy particularly these two here. They're a little puffy, so let's pull this motherboard out of here. Let's get everything disconnected. All right, we are free. Okay, so I have a replacement for this cap on hand, but not this one. Fortunately, this one's not too bad, so I think we're gonna be okay. But let's go ahead and get that one replaced. Let's get a little bit of flux on there. Now, you're probably aware that soldering on these motherboards can be pretty tricky, so that's why I like to use this desoldering alloy. It's really for surface mount components, but it works really well for through-hole components, too. And how it works is it dilutes the existing solder, thus lowering its melting temperature. I just work that in, let it wick to the top layer. And look at that, the capacitor just fell right off. Now, let's use a fluxy desoldering braid to get rid of that solder. Clean those pads up. There we go. Now let's get the replacement capacitor in there. Add some more flux. And solder it down. 
Now let's clip those leads. Let's just go over those one more time after they're clipped. Now I'll clean up the flux with IPA. Done and done. All right, let's get this board de-dusted with an anti-static brush. All right, that's looking better. And amazingly, that battery still has a charge. There's something about max cell batteries, I swear. Okay, let's check the health of that CPU fan. Okay, it sounds a little bit rattly. I guess we'll give it some love. That dust buildup, though. Let's get this thing cleaned up. Here's a lesser known reason why you shouldn't let dust build up in your computer. Dust can trap moisture, especially in humid environments, and that causes corrosion. See, we have some surface rust on this heat sink clip that was beneath those dust mounds. So yeah, just one more reason to keep those systems clean. Now let's do something about that deceased thermal pad. Let's soak that in IPA. Now for some reason, this is the gooeyest thermal compound I've ever seen. So I'm actually gonna try scraping it off with a guitar pick. Okay, well, despite its appearance, it's actually all clean now. Weirdly enough, that compound caused some discoloration on the metal. Very strange. All right, those are all cleaned up now. Looking good. Okay, let's do something about that noisy bearing now. Let's cut into that label to access it. Now let's drip some 3-in-1 oil down there. Now we'll run the fan for a minute to let that work in, and it's already sounding better. Now let's clean up any excess oil with IPA. That way the tape has a chance to stick. And finally, we'll seal it up with Captain Tape. Okay, let's check out that DVD drive. Here's what we have on the top side of the drive. Just some big scary warnings, some configuration info, and a little bit of dust. Let's wipe that off. And here's the bottom side of the drive. So we've had some moisture ingress into this thing. But we see it's a Toshiba drive, manufactured October 1999. Now let's check out that dusty power supply. This case has an interesting method of power supply retention. It's got this plate up here which has to be removed. And then it has this little tab in here which prevents the power supply from moving downward. So we're gonna have to push that in. There we go. There's nothing special about this power supply at all. It's just a regular old ATX power supply. I'm just gonna clean it up on the outside and blow it out with compressed air. Ah, fresh outdoor air. Let's make it not so fresh. And now that all that dust is out of the way, I'm peeking inside this thing and I do see a problem. So let me take it apart and show you. See all that glue around that transistor? When it takes on a dark color like that, it means it's absorbed moisture and it's become conductive because that glue is hygroscopic. And we can confirm that by measuring its resistance. And yup, definitely conductive. Even all the way on the other side of it, it actually even conducts through the transistor. So that's no good. And I see another problem. There's a severely overheated resistor down here. So this power supply is going directly to the scrap pile. All right, got an OSHA approved safety warning on there and into the scrap pile it goes. So normally I would use a thermal pad on CPUs this large, but I'm fresh out, so messy thermal paste it is. Now let's get the heatsink back on. Okay, I've got a non-homicidal power supply connected. So let's see what this thing does. Power on and it does nothing, not even a beep. Okay, let's investigate. Okay, I've got this thing stripped down to minimums. So let's see what the post analyzer card says. And it says we're dead. But we do have all the correct voltages, so that's not the problem. Let's see if we can figure out what is the problem. Well, it is interpreting the reset signal though. Well, the CPU, VRM, and chipset are getting warm, so we're definitely getting power. Yeah, this thing's not giving me very many clues. I'm starting to think this thing was powered up with that sketchy power supply and it fulfilled its homicidal aspirations. Okay, I pulled the motherboard back out to get a closer look. Everything looks fine. The IO and core voltages are set correctly. All jumpers and dip switches are set correctly. Tried different RAM, different video card, no go. So the only thing left to do is to see if that CPU is dead or not. Let's go ahead and move that over to a different system. Okay, got that CPU in another system. Let's see. And it posts just fine. Okay, so at least you know the CPU is good. Let's try the RAM. Okay, and the RAM is fine too. Okay, let's try one more thing before I declare this thing dead. Let's hit that AGP and RAM slot with some deoxid. Well, let's see what we get now. Oh, it's working! <laughs> you can't be serious! <laughs> you know, I'm just gonna start using deoxid on everything first. Okay, well, I guess we can continue testing. Okay, let's try this again. Okay, now it's dead again. What is going on? 
Okay, I've tested this thing nine ways from Sunday. Tried deoxid again, cleaned up edge connectors, tried known good parts, tried a PCI video card. This time, it ain't coming back. I even pulled it back out of the case on the off chance that something was shorting it out, and it's still dead. There's only one logical explanation for all this. Gremlins. Specifically, electrolytic gremlins. That's the only thing I can think of to cause such erratic behavior. Either that or a cracked BGA solder ball somewhere. I don't think the deoxid was really what brought this thing back to life, because all those connectors look clean as can be. Either way, it's time to move on. Well, we can at least test that DVD drive. Got it connected to my little compact desk pro here. Let's see if it opens. Ugh, <laughs> just sounds terrible. That's the sure sign of a Toshiba drive. But at least it opens. Let's see if it reads. And it reads. All right, well, at least that thing works. And you know what else is bizarre? I didn't see that power LED come on at any point. Let's see if that thing works. Yeah, yep, sure does. Okay, that's just another weird thing about that motherboard. Unless it just had the wrong polarity all its life. Might as well look at the hard drive LED too. And that one works too. Let's see if I can clean that scuff mark off. Nah, that's plastic damage. If I really wanted to, I could probably wet sand and polish it. But that ain't happening today. Well, that motherboard certainly was an emotional roller coaster. But I actually really like this case. It's actually really sturdy and well built. Definitely something I can make use of in the future. I'll just have to find something to fill that other five and a quarter inch drive bay. And at least I got some good parts out of this system. I'm pretty sure there's nothing wrong with the CPU, RAM, or video card. And despite having a noisy tray, the DVD drive does work. It's always good to have an IDE DVD ROM drive around. Let's move on to the next system. Okay, it's time to delight in an inlight case. I see we have a hard drive in that five and a quarter inch bay above the DVD ROM drive. And that's a 60 gig max tour drive on rails. I'm very glad to have those rails on hand. Got a dirty old floppy drive down here. Power and reset buttons feel okay. Here's what we have around the back. Got an ATX motherboard, no peripheral cards, and no power supply. But we do have plenty of stuff on board, including onboard sound, four USB ports, a NIC, and onboard video. This motherboard's looking kind of newish with those four USB ports. This case has a very interesting method for opening. Looks like the faceplate has to come off first. Let's hope that plastic's not too brittle. Well, let's see how it goes. Ooh. <laughs> well, that took some force. Luckily, nothing broke. And we got two hard drives in there. That lower drive's looking awfully newish. Oh, we've got some info here. Yeah, I kind of get the feeling this thing's been upgraded. And that asset tag number looks awfully similar to those radio station systems I did a while back. Looks like that lower drive's a 200 gigabyte Seagate, assuming it hasn't been upgraded. Well, let's get this thing open and see. Okay, so this side panel should slide towards the front. There we go. Oh yeah, this thing's definitely been upgraded. Well, this thing's looking quite like a parts machine. Not a single drive cable. Gotta love InLight's commitment to quality with that ferrite ring around the front panel connectors. A ferrite ring helps suppress electromagnetic interference, providing all kinds of benefits. The motherboard is made by Gigabyte, model GA-G41M-ES2L, a dual BIOS motherboard. Yeah, definitely on the more modern side. Socket LGA775, so most likely an Intel Pentium or a Core 2 Duo. And this machine is definitely from the time where we were transitioning away from IDE in favor of SATA, with having only one IDE channel. But luckily we do have an onboard floppy controller, and we have some PCI Express slots. Well, let's see what kind of CPU we have. And that is indeed an Intel Pentium, with very sparse thermal paste. Let's pull that out of there. Got an Intel Pentium E5500, dual core chip at 2.8 gigahertz. All the pads look good. The socket looks pretty good as well. I'm actually gonna put that CPU back in there while I clean this thing up. That way there's less chance for dust to get in that socket. Now let's clear some of that dust off. Now let's clean up the remnants of that thermal paste. See we have a little nick in that CPU. Wonder how that happened. Now let's utilize one of the awesome features of the in-light cases and pull these drives out. These cases are known for their super simple drive removal. So you just squeeze these tabs and pull. Just like that. And here's that 60 gig Maxtor drive. Hey, this thing is new. Can't beat that. Got a manufacture date of July 1st, 2003. It is an IDE drive. Let's wipe that dust off. 
This DVD drive is pretty modern compared to most things I show on this channel. The manufacture date of July 1st, 2012. It is a SATA drive, made by Sony OptiArc, or however you pronounce that. Let's wipe it off. And that Seagate hard drive is actually 250 gigabytes. It is also a SATA drive, and there's one of those radio resource stickers. So yeah, this thing might have come from that same radio station. And I guess that date code indicates it was manufactured in 2009. I'm not exactly sure of the format of that date code, but 2009 seems to track. Let's wipe it off. And finally, here's that dirty old floppy drive made by Panasonic. And this thing is definitely gonna need some cleanup inside. Oh yeah, super dusty. This thing is definitely ready to wreck some discs. We've got a lot of dust buildup in the front here, so let's get this faceplate off. There we go. Let's release that tiny spring and get that door off. And now you can really see the horrors that lie within. Let's sweep this thing out. Let's try to use this microfiber cloth to get up in there. Yeah, that worked out. Now let's clean those heads. Not bad, not bad. Let's clean the old grease off that lead screw. Let's move that thing up a little. Now let's get some new grease in there. And done. Now let's service this CPU cooler. It actually feels really good. No trouble out of the bearings. It's just quite a bit dusty in there. The problem is there's no way to remove that fan without wrecking these clips because the fan is retained by the same screws that secure the heatsink to the motherboard. So I'm just gonna have to clean it up as best I can with what I can reach. Let's see, this paintbrush should be able to reach inside those fins. Okay, that's clean enough. Let's clean that thermal paste off. There we go. Let's get some fresh cool juice on that CPU. And get the heat sink back on. You should always tighten these in stages in a crisscross pattern. Just go a little bit at a time on each screw. Let's drop two gigs of DDR2 in there. And reconnect that fan. And that battery still has a charge, so I'm gonna leave it alone for now. All right, got some drive cables in there. Got a power supply in there. Let's see what it does. And no post. That seems to be the theme this week. Let me get a speaker attached and see if it's complaining. And once again, not a peep out of the speaker. Let's consult the post analyzer card. Okay, well at least we get codes out of this one. I still haven't found a really reliable source of information on what those codes actually mean, but it looks like it might be stuck in reset. Let's see if it responds to the reset button. And no, it does not. Let's pull that reset switch. Maybe it's stuck. Nope, that's not it. All right, let's scrutinize that RAM. Okay, I pulled that RAM and everything else off the motherboard. Let's see now. Nope, exact same behavior. This thing should be freaking out about having no RAM, and that CPU is completely cold, whereas the North Bridge is actually a little bit warm, so that CPU is either dead or not getting power. This is definitely the correct power supply for this motherboard. It has the CPU power connector there, and I know this power supply is good. Okay, I tried another power supply. That made no difference. This board is from 2009, so it should be outside of the scope of the capacitor plague. And all the capacitors look fine. All other components look fine too. Nothing's getting excessively hot. I did find this scratch on the back of the board. It doesn't look like it's deep enough to have cut those traces. But right now, it's the only thing I have to go on. So let's expose that solder mask and check them, using this rubber polishing bit on a Dremel Mix short work of solder mask. Here's a trick I like to use for probulating these microscopic traces. I just take a sewing needle and wrap it around the meter probe with some copper wire. That makes it real easy to pinpoint the trace you want. So let's check those traces. That one's good. That one's good. And so is that one. And they're all fine. Okay, at least we ruled that out. Okay, well I was just probing around the board, and I found we have no activity on any of these MOSFETs here, and none of them are shorted. So that definitely explains why the CPU is not getting power. I found this surface mount fuse up here, but it's not blown, so that's out as a possibility. Well, clearly this board needs a lot of attention, and as of right now, I'm not willing to give it that attention. Luckily, I don't personally find this board very interesting. It's just a little bit too new for my tastes, so it can sit on the shelf until I feel adventurous enough to dive back into it. Let's go ahead and test the rest of the system. 
The challenge of finding a motherboard with both a floppy controller and SATA is an easy one when you hoard as much stuff as I do. This is an AM2 board. I think it came out of a Dell or something. And it's just right for testing that floppy and DVD drive. So let's see what those do. Starting with the floppy drive. Okay, we got a seek on that drive. And the floppy drive works. Not sure what I screwed up in config.sys, but hey, floppy drive works. Okay, how about the DVD drive? Opens right up. Let's see if it boots good old Canopics. And looks like it wants to. Go ahead. Yeah, that drive's doing just fine. And success. And for the hard drives, I'm just going to use my IDE slash SATA to USB adapter connected to the bench PC. So let's see what these do. Starting with the 60 gig Max Tor. Let's see if we have a block device. And we do not. Let's see if we have any kernel output related to that. And we do, but it sounds like that hard drive is struggling. It's making a very faint but sad clicking sound. Let's see if we have a block device now. Oh, there it is. Guess it just took it a minute. Doesn't look like we have any partitions on it. Maybe it was wiped. Let's see. Hmm, yeah, that drive is struggling. Yeah, sounds like it's just not happening. Can't even break out of F-Disk. Oh well, we're gonna have to cancel that manually. Okay, let's check out the Seagate drive. Let's see if we have a block device. And we do. And there's a partition on it. Let's see what kind of partition that is. And that's an NTFS partition. Let's get out of here. Let's see if we can mount it. Okay, we had an unclean dismount at some point, but it did mount. Well, let's see what's on that thing. And looks like we have a Windows install on it, possibly Windows XP. Let's see what's in there. I'm guessing this is the primary user profile. Let's see what's on the desktop. Okay, got a bunch of shortcuts, documents, MP3s, and pictures. Pretty normal stuff. Looks like we have a bunch of documents on here. Going all the way back to 1996, apparently. Say, what's in that computer directory? This computer may have been owned by the IT person. This might be the original motherboard that was in this case. Let's blow that up. Looks like it might have had a socket 478 motherboard at some point. Let's close that. I better not go any further. I don't want to have to spend two hours blurring stuff out. Okay, well that drive works. I sure wish it wasn't SATA though. Okay, let's clean up this faceplate. Let's see how far Windex gets us. Okay, Windex isn't even touching these scuffs. Let's try IPA. Yeah, that's doing it. All right, didn't turn out too bad. It's definitely gonna need some retro brighting though. And I got the backside cleaned up too. Wasn't too bad. Okay, let's get this thing refaced. It's definitely a lot easier to put on than to take off. Well, we found another dead motherboard, but hey, at least I got an awesome in-light case out of the deal. That's always good. And it's a shame those are SATA drives. I probably have more SATA drives than anything, but oh well. Maybe they'll come in handy someday. I'm gonna go ahead and wipe that hard drive since it has so many documents on it. Let's move on to the next system. You know, I never imagined this style of case could become a nostalgia trigger, but this thing just screams and shouts mid-2000s, adorned with fake chrome accents everywhere. We've got a little door down here hiding some USB ports. It also has cutouts for audio and firewire. And apparently has a Pentium 4 CPU, and this thing may have been put together by a small-time system assembler. And here's our power and reset buttons. And that battered memory card reader looks like it was cut out of something. And we have a floppy drive. Gotta have that. And we have a 52 speed CD burner. And below that a DVD burner with LightScribe. LightScribe was a technology developed by HP. And that allowed you to burn custom labels into your optical media. As long as it was LightScribe media. And that was just the coolest thing back in the day. And here's the back of the machine. Standard issue ATX motherboard. With onboard video, USB, NIC, and sound. And we have a dial-up modem as our lone peripheral card. And this case is missing both of its side panels. I'm not really feeling too bad about that. This is actually a really low quality case. All this metal is just so thin. It feels like I could crumple it up like a ball of tin foil. It is impossibly light for being a fully loaded system. But hey, we have a hard drive in there. Maybe we'll finally get to explore an OS. The motherboard is made by ASUS, or ASUS if you prefer. Model P4P800MX with no AGP. That is just criminal. Let's get that dial-up modem out of there. 
Pretty basic 56k modem. I will find a use for these one day. These are somewhat modern looking power connectors. So somebody was trying to breathe new life into this thing. Let's get these drives disconnected. Now let's get power off that motherboard. Let's see what we have for RAM. Super talent. Well, that brings back memories. I had a couple of these in my system back in the day because they were quite cheap. Got a one gig stick of DDR1 here. Let's see what else we have. This one's a 512 meg stick and we have a speed mismatch. The last stick was PC3200 and this stick is PC2700. You can mix and match modules with different speeds, but the faster sticks will downclock themselves to match the sticks with lower speeds. Let's check out the next one. And another gig of super talent memory. This system has so much talent. This is also a PC3200 stick. All right, so we got 2.5 gigs of RAM in this thing. And this time I'm waiting until we confirm this motherboard's functional before I refresh that thermal grease. I wasted enough of that on those dead boards. And here's the hard drive, 80 gigabyte Seagate Barracuda. Looks like it was manufactured in 2005. And this one is IDE. And here's the CD burner made by Light On, manufactured May 2004, also an IDE drive. And here's that LightScribe DVD burner made by TSST, or as I like to call them, TST. And that stands for Toshiba Samsung Storage Technology, manufactured November 2006. And I pulled out this card reader to see what was up with it. It has an HP part number, and it looks like it was harvested rather violently from whatever system it came from. See, they just cut the faceplate there. Hey, whatever works. I don't judge. And the floppy drive is made by Mitsumi. And this is funny. They actually omitted the bottom row of pins there. Those pins all connect to ground, so you're not missing anything. I just thought that was a funny cost-cutting measure. And you already know what I'm going to do next. Though I must say, this one is remarkably clean inside. And actually, so is the rest of the system. Kudos to whoever owned this machine. And just look at how flimsy this case is. <laughs> the importance of quality sheet metal cannot be overstated. Yeah, this power supply is definitely on the newer side. It doesn't have a minus 5 volt rail. It's also ridiculously light which in my experience is always an indicator of a crappy power supply. So let's see if we can blow it up. Will sparks fly? Let's find out. A little high on the five volt rail there. Let's give it some extra load. Okay, that's surviving. Let's load up the 12 volt rail. Okay, I guess this thing's worthy for now. Okay, we're 0 for 2 on motherboards this week. Let's hope this one doesn't let us down. Let's see. Oh, things are happening. And we're posting. All right, finally. And we got CMOS complaints. No problem. Let's continue with defaults. And Windows XP. I had a feeling I'd find you here. And we're already in. And I already see potentially sensitive data. So this drive's getting wiped. Oh no, Norton's disabled. We are in danger. All right, let's see what we have on here. Not a whole lot. Looks like somebody was just using us as their office PC. All default games. Let's go look at the root of that drive. Let's see our free space situation. A little over a quarter full. I see that card reader is working. That's what all these are about. All right, let's go into that hard drive. Let's get some details. Let's try to figure out when the last time this thing was used. Okay, we're up to 2014 in here. Let's go into the documents and settings and the user profile. Ooh, we are struggling. Must be a lot of documents in here. Either that or that hard drive is failing. Yeah, there are so many documents on here. Let's up our newest date stamp. October 2014, I think we have a winner. All right, let's get out of here. See if all that RAM got counted. I didn't even notice the post. And yep, sure did. Well, let's see what that floppy drive does. It does nothing. Not even a seek. It may not be configured in the BIOS. All right, let's cancel that. How about the CD burner? And looks like it works. Yep, works just fine. How about the DVD burner? A little bit dusty in there. And 
man, looks like that one works too. Yes, indeed. Okay, let's get into the bio settings and see what's going on with that floppy drive. Okay, well it is set. Legacy diskette. There's nothing in here that specifically disables it, I don't think. No, there's something else causing that to not work. Well, let's test it in another system. I am really loving this Compact Desk Pro for testing things. It's so easy to get parts in and out of it. I did a video on this thing a while back, which I'll link to. All right, that floppy drive's connected. Let's see if it works. And yes, it does. Boot it up with no problems. Okay, well, we broke this week's curse. If I had found three dead motherboards in a row, I would definitely be concerned. Now, the question is, if I did have the side panels, would I want to use this case? Probably not. While I definitely like its time capsule styling, this case is just way too flimsy. I feel like this thing would probably collapse if somebody tried to sit on it, and I just can't expose a retro motherboard to that kind of risk. I'll find something to do with it. Well, I guess I better get some 1500 microfarad caps in stock. I just need a Mauser warehouse in my backyard. And I wonder if an AGP slot can be added to this Pentium 4 board. I've heard that's possible on some boards. And by the way, I'm going to be at BCF Midwest this weekend. And this one's going to be especially tough for me because there's no way I'm going to be able to get anything home. So I need to be on my best behavior as far as buying things goes. So if you're going to be attending the event, I'll see you there. But that's all for this video. Thanks for watching.